Right, I think we're about ready to start. Um, so, good evening. Thank you very much to everybody that's joined us in the uh, in the room this evening. Thank you to everybody that's online. Tonight's talk is by Andrew Brown. Um, now, I, I asked Andrew to come and give this talk because I gave this. I saw this talk about two years ago. I thought it was a fascinating subject, very close to my own heart. I'm sure you'll all enjoy it this evening greatly. So, just to introduce Andrew. Andrew's a, a principal engineering geologist with GRM in Derby. He graduated in 2004, has worked in the UK and overseas, um, and currently works, as I've mentioned, for GRM. And um, hopefully this will be a thoroughly entertaining discussion. <laughs> Andrew, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very thank much. You. Good evening, guys and girls. Um, Thank you for inviting me to give this talk, Scott, in this uh, prestigious venue. Um, yeah, I've I've sort of it's this this whole talk is based on a bit of a case study um, based on a site in northwest Leicestershire, but um, uh, I was told to jazz up the title somewhat, so I've made some references in the talk to uh, Gerard Butler. So there's one. That is just for the ladies in the audience. Um, yeah, so um, I'll talk through it. So a bit of, bit of a background, I'm pretty sure most people will know the general forms of mining in the country, but um, just puts a bit of uh, context to the situation uh, on the site in Leicestershire. So um, obviously, you know, in Great Britain, we've been mining for uh, thousands of years and uh, Generally depicted upon this, you know, this uh, this picture from the uh, National Coal Mining Museum, but that only really covers from the 15th century to the present day, um, and we're talking about you know early door sort of uh, windless bell pit scenarios where you're mining out of the outcrop of a seam, and that seam could be anything from coal, uh, lead, or zinc, whatever whatever they're going for. So then more mechanized um, features of, of mining with this horse and gin arrangement, I'll show a sort of picture and obviously deeper, deeper mines. And then all the way through uh, as we get through into the uh, industrial revolution. And obviously that's powered a bit by um, the, the mechanization of the, of the time, but also the need to get better quality coal at depth. So, you know, generally with the bell pits, we're talking in the range of 12 meters, but certainly with the, um, the horse and ginny arrangement, they're somewhere in the region of 30 meters. Um, obviously, as we go through time, they get deeper and deeper and we're talking into the you know, hundreds of meters. Um, not necessarily is the case though, um, I found a, a a picture of a friend of mine who, who lives in Bretby around the corner from Burton. And uh, it depicted this scenario where they found this, um, some timber props and uh, shutter into to, to shafts as part of the lounge open, open cast there, which is near Lounge, near Ashby. And uh, they basically dated the timbers back to around 1450. So you know, put it into some context, they're sinking 30 meter holes in 1450, um, which I found uh, really interesting. And they and they discovered all this when they were uh, open casting and sort of chopping back through uh, the uh, the bell pit arrangement there at the top and, and the open cast. Um, obviously, <clears throat> the uh, the history of the of the country is is really founded on uh, on coal mining. Uh, it could be argued, and um, obviously with uh, this, this has got this graph here, which shows obviously the level of coal production in uh, over time, and that 
spikes to around the early uh, 20th century to around 285 million tonnes. But there's a number of um, legal acts that sort of uh, help to um, give, give that momentum towards how much coal people needed. So we've got the uh, sort of the Mines Act 1842, which was based upon, that was brought in because um, of um, a coal mining disaster in Silkston, uh, which is a village in Barnsley where uh, a number of children were, were killed in a, in, a, in a mine flooding accident. And uh, that obviously uh, influenced the, the national um, thought at the, at the time to bring that in to stop uh, women and children working in the mines. Um, then we have the Public Health Act in 1848, which was really to get better sanitation into the system for, um, you know, clean clean water, obviously living conditions. Um, that then would have been pretty horrendous. And so um, we have that as a drive for our, uh, for mining more coal and, and related uh, minerals. Um, then, of course, we've got the 1872 Coal Mines Regulation Act, which talks about effectively needing abandonment plans, which a lot of us today as engineers will know if we've uh, come across coal mining uh, legacy, will we'll, if we're lucky, have the chance to go and have a look at them and see see what they did back in the day. And then obviously peaking, peaking about 1910 and then dropping off uh, somewhat, which sort of coincides with the need to sort of... Um, inspect all mines and quarries and what, what people were doing from a health and safety point of view, but also uh, clean air acts because places like the place, uh, the city I'm in at the minute, were suffering greatly with uh, smog and pollution. And then of course, we've got the uh, 1994 Coal Industry Act, which is what um, the coal authority were born out of. So and they, they obviously, if you don't know, they, they look after the coal legacy. It's their job to uh, mind that asset. So bell pits uh, come in many different forms. Um, some of them are, are pictured there. There's the usual sort of the subcircular spoil heap with a depression in the middle. Uh, you have this sort of this gin circle arrangement here. Um, now, not very clear, and there's a bit of depression in the middle there. To sort of uh, for those who aren't aware of gin circles, this is what it would actually look like. Uh, this is at uh, Swannington near Ashby, and the and the horse would would be tethered to the to the wheel, and the wheel would um, then be connected to the shaft at the far end there, and be able to winch up and down the mineral and or people that were going down into work the uh, work the seams, and a lot of these are. Um, Certainly these guys are, you can find these on things like Heritage England. They're, they're usually scheduled monuments. Uh, they do, obviously, that some of them do stick out like a sore thumb, with the exception of uh, this little guy at the top, which is, if, uh, if you're familiar with the Syria guidance, uh, that's from the, um, the Bell Pit example at Gipton in Leeds. You might as well have uh, the guys who decide to have lunch in the, in the Bell Pit, which... Uh, <laughs> Slightly disconcerting, to be honest. Um, those are the obvious types, not so obvious. Um, I think uh, LIDAR is a fantastic tool, uh, modern day tool for finding such features that aren't so obvious. And it's um, basically uh, time in time, it's based on the premise of, of firing, a, firing a, 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 an intermittent light at thousand thousand or a million times per second at a target and measuring how uh, the time it takes to for that signal to get back to the uh, receiver so here we have a uh, we have an example here of a rather uh, inconspicuous wood um, near uh, Silkston in Barnsley and uh, there's a golf course here as well you can see the bunkers but when you overlay the lidar you can see that the uh, the wood is in fact pockmarked with lots of little bell pits. Um, I kind of like this example because um, you know from a desk study point of view, if the untrained eye uh, uh, 
wasn't just went to lidar finder and found that then they might see these little guys and oh there's there's some more valve pits down there but of course they're the bunkers um typical characteristics so i use this as a bit of a citation because i'll do a comparison with this at the end so these are the sorts of things that are cited in the in the updated serial guide in 758 um updated from the sp32 uh, that was issued in the in the 80s and uh, you know the usual characteristics in the one one to one and a half meter size diameter generally as i say being about 10 to 12 meters depth and the extraction target well i've named some there clay coal limestone lime chalk but to be fair it could be anything that locals felt was um a commodity to to the local market generally obviously backfilled pretty loose arisings and um bell pits themselves not that closely um uh spaced really so they tend to be quite decent uh far uh, space apart in terms of two and a half meter centers but this is just from Syria 758 um there are obviously other memoirs and uh, information available, such as uh, based on the on the case study, uh, this little book here by Colin Owen was uh, wealth on its own, as well as the uh, memoir for the uh, for the uh, BGS sheet as well. So talking a bit more about the, uh, the case study itself, uh, just setting the scene. So our site is the uh, Gold Star. And uh, on the left hand side, we've got the pull out there from the uh, Coal Authority Interactive Viewer. And um, generally, it, you know, it's a small, smallish sort of coal field, northwest Leicestershire, but the high risk development zone, uh, which is where basically planning is you need to do a coal authority, a uh, coal mining risk assessment, you can't get away with without doing one, uh, occupies probably 15% of the total area of that coal field. Um, but um, geologically speaking, there's quite it's quite complex. So there's quite a lot of uh, superficial deposits in terms of uh, glacial till. But you've got this uh, window through the Triassic into the Carboniferous deposits, um, and effectively the coal field itself or the exposed part of the coal field is marked by uh, or bounded by the Boothorpe Fault to the south and the Thringston Fault to the north. And they have a throw in the region of uh, uh, between a thousand feet and two thousand feet, respectively. There we go. I've drawn a nice little cross section because we like that as geologists, <laughs> um, which depicts this uh, Ashby anticline in the middle here, which is marked by this little blue axis line here. And so we have the uh, the lower coal measures in the middle there, of course, uh, with a few of the uh, uh, Triassic strata on top. And then we've got the, mid the middle coal measures on the left-hand side of the booth fault here. And here we have the prominent seams down to the main coal, coal seam, which is the most worked coal seam in the district. Uh, but you not very clear on here, but you've also got quite a few pot clay seams uh, these are prominent scenes of fire clay in the region. So uh, essentially the region um, is productive on both fronts in terms of pottery clays for earthenware and brick production, but also for coal um, and, uh, and, the, and the standard sort of industries that go along with that. But you could sort of split it into five different districts. Uh, one and four being the most productive in the low in, in the uh, middle coal measures. Three is sort of restricted to the small scale enterprises, which is not surprising given there, there are some workable scenes in here. Uh, the most work scene is the Kilburn there. But in my book, coal is coal, and uh, if it burns, uh, it shall be won. Um, the, uh, it goes back to. In terms of evidence, as I say, I've talked about stuff in Leicestershire going back to 1450 as a as a context of where Lant is. Lant's about here on the on the cusp of Ashby. So, um, uh, you know, we're talking the best part of uh, 
you know, 800, 800 years of history there. And a bit of context on the coal production front, but effectively between the 17th and 19th century, production went up uh, tenfold, uh, up to about 2.1 million tonnes at the start of the 19th century. So <clears throat> site geology, a bit more zoomed in now. Um, this blue line, dashed line here is the Blackfordby Fault. So the, it's the, this is in the village of Blackfordby. It's not a very big place. And um, this acts to sort of down throw strata associated with um, the lower coal measures by about 40 or 50 metres. But you've effectively got these coal outcrops on the um, west side of the fault, but then you have some outcrops on the east side, but you've got quite a bit of subcropping as well underneath the uh, Triassic sandstone of the Moira formation in the orange and the uh, Hellsby sandstone at the top. Um, as I say, the Kilburn seam uh, is the lowest perceived one that they would go and find because that sits just above the uh, Wingfield flags. But uh, you've also got the Eureka seam at the top, and that's also quite a, a high quality coal. But if we look a bit further into the borehole, the historical boreholes in the area, and these are the sorts of things you find in Geo Index, um, you'll see little pots of gold here that say, coal, hot clay, clunch for sanitary pipes. And you start to sort of, when you're doing a desk study, you start to try and build up a picture about what's actually being used, what's actually being worn out of the ground here, sorry. Um, so it's not just coal, they're, they're interested in pretty much anything they can get their hands on. So the history of the site, we all like uh, historical maps, but they go back to about 1900. So we can only really inform what's gone on in the last hundred and, uh, 20 or so years. So the village itself was subject, you know, our sites in down here, these lovely uh, little fields, uh, not much, not much to do down there, but evidence of uh, obviously mining, some old clay shafts splattered about the place. Um, and then we see from the sort of 50s and 60s that there's some uh, excavations just in the north of the site. Uh, indicative of um, clay pits and um, we know from the coal authority report that they you know they come with the same sort of uh, uh, nomenclature seams at shallow depth where it's last 1905 you know there's a bit of disturbed ground shown on the 1 to 10 and um, the coal mining risk assessment that was done by others basically said you know we're talking about un unrecorded mine entries but they perceived it to be a low risk because there weren't any obvious spoil mounds or depressions. Um, that's a bit more of a zoomed in view to put a context on how much of the clay pits uh, occupied the site. Nothing really going on in the bottom part. Um, and this is a sort of a general ground model, which is you know generally a good thing to do for geologists to get their head around where you know uh, the geo-environmental engineers amongst us will be doing conceptual site models and this is no different from uh, a geotechnical or an engineering geologist point of view to depict you know how why they would have worked that side of it as opposed to uh, the west side of the fault uh, given only only the Kilburn seam is there um, so Originally, we were uh, tasked with this job from a due diligence point of view. So there was a third party involved uh, to begin with, and they had sort of peppered the site in terms of trial pits and the usual sort of intrusive investigation, windowless samples, rotary holes for, for coal mining. Um, but, you know, it looks like a greenfield site, but they find uh, example sort of logs here saying, you know, firm to stiff, uh, clay, organic wood matter. Then they're on to what one would probably considered to be weathered coal measure strata, but um, this is quite variable ground. And so you start to think, well, I'm on a greenfield site, but I'm finding quite variable ground conditions. So uh, we need to think about this a little bit, little bit more. So um, a developer that uh, Gio and my friends with came to us and said, hey, we're, we're, we're thinking about buying this site and we need to start uh, thinking about our abnormal costs. So uh, can you review this information and, um, uh, you know, do you think we need to do some extra work? So we, we had a, we had a little, um, 
look around the existing information as you do, and then we try to piece some of, together some of our local knowledge and um, uh, data sets within the uh, library we've got at work there, and um, sort of had some punches as to look we we could maybe expect some bell pits in the area. So uh, one of one of the lines of evidence was uh, historical photography, which I think is worth its weight in gold at the minute, um, and stacking up um, uh, historical imagery can give you a, a sense of how how that site has changed over time. So don't know if it's clear there, but there's a list in the, within that uh, red. What there's like a, a a blob type darker patch, let's call it. And when you compare that with the 1968 image, that's, you know, the, the contrast is there, that, that shows up a bit more. So um, something to at least investigate. Uh, as I say, we, we know from other areas just around the corner that we, we, we are involved in site stripping and you're seeing features like these, um, you know, circular uh, features, uh, backfill with some black mushy stuff it's uh, it screams of uh, some sort of coal legacy so we're trying to we're trying to put two and two together but you know as any good uh, uh, consultancy will tell you um, you don't just do a desk study and go well we've sold you the answer we need to go in there and uh, actually investigate and see the ground for ourselves um, so we we embarked on a on a twofold approach. One was to do a geophysical investigation, and one and the other part was intrusive. So the the geophysical investigation um, targeted mainly the southern part of the site. It's not gone for the for the clay pit in the north due to uh, development constraints there and phase planning. Um, we only really used it to delineate the southern high, high wall of that, not not the full extent. But effectively, the geophysical investigation was made up of uh, magnetic uh, survey and electromagnetic uh, uh, survey as well. And, um, you know, the, the, the outputs didn't really um, say too much, in certainly in terms of the magnetic stuff. This is the stuff that's looking for ferrous uh, material within the, uh, within the parent material. Um, so it's showing up little spot marks here. But these aren't necessarily indicative of the uh, presence of bell pits. Again, not much to say for the magnetic surveys. And certainly when you cross-reference where the scenes outcrop, um, yeah, nothing, nothing to join, join the two together. But again, with the uh, connectivity survey, uh, we see this zone uh, prominent that was marked on the aerial map, um, indicative of um, more uh, cohesive material and possibly water bearing as well, whereas the lighter blue areas are um, not as conductive, so maybe more indicative of um, presence of bedrock. We obviously followed it with the intrusive survey and um, made the site look like a dartboard at the end of it. Um, but effectively, knowing that uh, windless samples and um, uh, things like rotary holes are good on a point-to-point -point basis, we needed to go in there and do child trenches as well because that gives you the best cross-section. The advantage on this site was that the trenches were uh, done in combination with an archaeological survey. And uh, this is the sorts of things that were found. We've got this large black mass uh, with sort of ashy black clay backfill in amongst the orangey brown parent material, uh, indicative of um, weathered uh, coal measure strata. But uh, to simply do that on its own, um, you know, and sort of charge trenches like this, we're going to understand that they are, or you know, a feature is there, but uh, we don't necessarily um, understand the full extent of where the bell pits. Uh, occupy the site. Um, those who will have read series 758 might notice this little diagram which sort of talks about a, a, a sort of a throughput flow chart in terms of what one needs to do when he's planning the GI and um, 
what sort of things to consider and methodology and then what what are we going to do but the thing i would take from this is that uh, this isn't just a throughput what we found was this this bit needs to be circular we need to keep reviewing what we're doing and tailor it to the uh, investigation needs now sometimes the client doesn't understand that they want the answer straight away for the pot of money they've just given you but um Sometimes that makes for interesting conversations, but uh, it's down to us as uh, as geologists and professionals to keep um, reviewing what we're doing and, and just making sure we we fully understand the problem that uh, is possibly on the site. So a couple of videos to sort of um, try and convey the full scale of the problem, which was we 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 had we had a drone on site, so we all love drone images. You know, it, it, it can't get enough of them. <clears throat> and effectively, you know, we we end up with this site strip when when the developers on site, and we end up with this um, portion of land, and it's obviously not fully stripped. You can see some revealed at the bottom here. Uh, which is about 60 metres uh, wide and about 120 metres across. And, um, yeah, I mean, it just looks like a giant Connect 4 grid. Um, <laughs> and, you know, to be fair to the drone, I think it conveys the, it does convey the scale of the problem. Um, uh, uh, and one one that could possibly miss. But, you know, it's it's really, really quite an interesting image from the point of view of, you know we've got we've got little pits that they're all in a line um there's a there's obviously a, a boundary mark going on here they look roughly parallel to this footpath that was going through or maybe parallel to 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 the hedge line there's lots of things going on in that picture but impressive nonetheless so obviously from our the, the developers on site and he sat there with um you know GRM aren't going to go in and do a site strip we need six or eight moxes and a few three six thirteen fourteen ton three sixties to do the job for us so um yeah we we unveiled sort of 300 over 300 bell pits and generally the spacings where the widths were anywhere from 0.66 to 5.44 meters wide and obviously the dimensions i give for you earlier was roughly about seven and a half thousand uh, meters squared but uh, the correlation is generally very good with the um, with the aerial picture, effectively. So we so we um, we went in with the GPS and we um, you know ascribed each bell pit their diameter and, and put that into a QGIS to to give us some funky sort of overlays. And it's that you know it's very peculiar. We've got these very small pits uh, raging to quite large pits and probably somewhat synonymous with probably the rest of the pits there. Not much in the way of parent material. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't correlate with the seam outcrop within the in the coal. Um, similarly, with the uh, conductive zone on the um, uh, western side of the hedge, there was no um, bell pits uh, features found there either. So, and and of course it's buried beneath uh, about 0.6 of topsoil. So, you know the mind starts worrying about what what could this be. When could it be? There are no the archaeologists couldn't find any uh, uh, artifacts to sort of date date it. So uh, the sort of mind wonders, and you and you kind of end up going down a bit of a rabbit hole of what could have happened. But um, uh, somewhat impressive, nonetheless. So um, you know the developers on site, and he's quite happily shifting his topsoil and then um you know it's like a draped curtain and he finds this horror show of ground condition and he's like sat there screaming ah oh, what do i do you know i need to build houses um obviously from a point of view of uh, the main ground that was continued that was uh, within these backfield pits it was very poor in terms of quality um very loose uh, very low strength so uh, you know we're going to we're not going to just going to plonk um, we can't really plonk sort of strip footings on there because they're up to five meters deep. Um, all the usual sort of poor ground bearing capacities, differential settlement, 
water bearing, which is uh, obviously a problem in itself, and a potential grass source. Um, because we were out and about looking for, um, trying to correlate with the coal seams, we had a permit, so we did. We had to be really careful with how we liaise with the coal authority on this because um, we it could be conceivable. We we couldn't prove unequivocally that they that these bell pits were going for a mineral at the base of them. So um, effectively, uh, we had to play that uh, that card quite carefully. And and in the, you're in this realm of do we record them and blight the site? In which case. No, the guy's not going to sell his house, or what do we do? So effectively, we, um, you know, we could have we could have individually grouted and capped them, and I think that's what they effectively did at uh, Gipton and Leeds. Um, but the other the other solutions really uh, put forward to the client because they were on site with all this plant and wanting to you know crack on as house builders do was really about excavate, recompact. Um, feeding some lime in there to get this uh, made ground material down to a to an optimum moisture content because the moisture was quite sky high, well above 20%. And uh, the optimum was probably nearer uh, 16 to 18 range as, as one might expect for a clay. Um, and then effectively excavate, recompact, feed it through with the bind of the lime to about 2% lime NHBC don't really like more than 2% lime uh, in engineered fills and uh, and then effectively pile pile the excavation. So that's the that's a picture of the base of the excavation. You can see we've gone from this nice orange weathered material down to what one would expect would be uh, you know the 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 more uh, or the less sorry the less weathered uh, uh, lower coal measure strata. It's a bit of a scale problem there because you can't really see, you know, the drone's great, but you can't really see. But when you've got uh, uh, 14, 18 ton mock, uh, excavators with a with a five meter batter, uh, that kind of hopefully shows the scale of that excavation. Um, so effectively, you know, we've got this excavation, seven and a half thousand meters squared, which is roughly uh, for five meters deep, it's about 37 and a half thousand cube. So, um, Excavate, recompact, really, the, the, it was quite an easy sell in terms of cost saving because to export that amount of material through a small village in the middle of uh, uh, northwest Leicestershire uh, would have annoyed rather, rather a lot of the local uh, people and not to mention the CO2 emissions. And effectively, the uh, yeah, so we've got, we've got a cost, a ballpark cost of 1.8 million, and that's without the haulage. Um, but the cost of the lime in itself was in the uh, uh, 650 to 700,000 uh, pound range. So we've saved them about 1.1 1, 1. 1 million, um, which, was, uh, which was quite impressive, I think, to be honest. So um, some conclusions for the talk, really. Um, I think there's, there's, there's quite a lot to learn from this, to be honest. It's, it, we don't come across sites like this every day. I have put, I have put some other uh, evidence in there where we, GRM seem to keep finding them, um, but <laughs> they're not always there. Um, I would say anything in respect of unrecorded mine entries is don't write them off just because there's no physical evidence of them at the surface. Um, albeit, you know, the coal mining risk assessment said it was low, but um, I would at least temper that with some sort of intrusive investigation at that point. Um, Due diligence in in this in this sense has uh, has been really quite important, and uh, uh, this is coming from a guy who didn't really understand this when I was starting out in the industry, and and uh, and you sort of sat there you're going, you need to review somebody else's work, and I'm going, well, if they've done it properly, then why do I need to review it? But um, all this shows is is you can bring in little bits of your local knowledge and uh, and other industry knowledge to uh, to refine the risk for that site. Obviously, it was a greenfield site, greenfield. Um, but <clears throat> if there are questions to uh, to to certain points, then we need to start questioning the conceptual site models and ground models. 
obviously geophysical investigation was used, but we need to uh, refine that with intrusive SI as well. And uh, obviously the, the, the shallow nature of the pits uh, actually uh, was, was the saving grace here. If they were, if they were deeper than five meters, it would have been probably, it would have been a problem, I think for uh, uh, making the, the bulk excavation work. Um, and obviously, you know, the use of lime in this case uh, within that range of, of uh, 0.5 to 2% helped uh, develop a, uh, deliver a, a sustainable and uh, a solution with the minimal environmental impact. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, I, I do find that a fascinating case to do. I do, as somebody that's got an interest in mining legacy problems, I think talking about issues like that more is something that we really need, need to do. And I know you've given that talk on a, a number of occasions now at different locations. Um, but I think there's always something in it that I'm, I'm, you know, is new to me that you haven't perhaps mentioned before. Um, I haven't got any questions in the chat moment. There you go, John. I do. John Davis, GCG. Fascinating stuff. Um, the first obvious question for me is, since you've dug these things out completely, is what were they after? What were they mining? Well, that that I mean, that to me is 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 the is the sixty four thousand dollar question, isn't it? I mean, they they're not going for the coal. So my perception here is that they're they're. This isn't traditional fire clay, as one would perceive, but it may be, uh, it's orange in colour, so it may be for pigmentation of uh, sanitary pipes or something like that. It's it's very odd, you know, there, there might be an argument to suggest the orange is actually more of the weathered overspill from the Moira than from the Triassic uh, formation, but to have that many on, which is to me very clearly an individual basis of right that's your pit and by the way you there that's your pit over there you know it's that that to me screams of i've got a plot of land and i'm going to sell individual bits of land to uh, uh, for this commodity of earthenware pigmentation but it's there's, there's many an interpretation to that. Because it looks phenomenally well organised. Yes. It's got to be some oversee here, isn't there? So and I, it's a real shame the archaeologists yeah. didn't find anything, because I'd be fascinated to understand some sort of timescale around this. I mean, yeah, because if you go to Grimes Graves, effectively belt pit-like structures mm -hmm. in the chalk in East Anglia, they are 5,000 years old. So people had the, uh, the the brass neck, I won't say another word, to be, to be able to go 10, 12, 10, 12 metres there down yeah. to take flints out. Yeah. To have these things so close together geotechnically frightens the life out of them. Yes, uh, no, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's buried beneath 500 mm topsoil. I mean, my rule of thumb with, with archaeology is, I think it's you dig down a metre, you go 10,000 years or something. It... The topsoil there wasn't reworked, or it didn't look reworked. So, I, I'm kind. Of, I mean, I had the discussion this afternoon. To me, it could possibly be, be prehistoric, but um, I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's just interesting from that point of view. You know, why why did they go there and not and not to the not to the left hand side of that picture? It's I don't know. I'm going to be cheeky and ask one more. Uh, um, I'm interested in the lime now clearly looking at those two colors in that image we have stuff that's in the pits that's uh not oxidized yeah dark gray probably quite high sulfide contents and we have the orangey brown stuff which looks oxidized and you mix all of that up together it seems to me you might have had quite high sulfate contents within the material as you dug it out how did you get away with two percent lime? Uh, you, I would have expected you might have had heath problems. Yeah, I mean the 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 testing that was done effectively was let's bulk excavate this 
put it in a stockpile and we'll sample the living daylights out of it for the DREST ROM suites to effectively try and risk that away for those um, those very real problems that we all know. Thank you. Hi, Ben Tostel, uh, Transport for London. You've stolen one of my questions there, John. Um, firstly, I love coal mining stuff. Worked in Leeds for three years. Fantastic. Clearly, someone had a good day when they found the Eureka seam. And then the um, <laughs> the 12 inch uh, was only 0.1 meters thick. So it's clearly uh, not as continuous in thickness. Um, I, I like the way you showed there is value in doing a trial pit or a big trench. I think almost on any site, you do all these fancy small boreholes, you know, you're doing 200 mil, you're not getting an appreciation for lateral variability of the soil. Doing a trench is just invaluable. And here it's just so obvious yeah. what the problem is. Um, I guess it's similar, I suppose, it, hypothetically, but they're so close together. Why, why, why do they not just dig a big hole in the first place? Yeah, and this is this is why it comes for me. It comes down to an individual, an individuality in terms of the commodity here. For that very reason, you know, I don't I don't think they've been worked uh, next door to each other. I, I think they've I think they've gone sort of leapfrog and then come back. You know, the other the other thing here that I, I noticed and it, and it was apparent in the picture before on the, on the previous slide was. It's the same coloured material. It's the same type of material. So that, to me, is the control or the the oversight on this. That it it must be in some way related to the to wherever the spoil is being generated in the backfill material. It must be related to that somehow. Um, and of course, you know, there's no shortage of mines in the area, so uh, that could be one quite easy. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, and then I suppose, did you look into whether they had any problems when they built the estate, the existing estate next door? Did they have any sort of plans or did they encounter anything similar to this? No, there was nothing, there was nothing really that showed up there at all in terms that would have highlighted it in terms of precedence. Um, it's, you know, it's that, as you say, it's, it's before you touch on the sort of lines of evidence. It's not like we, we go on every site in the, you know, South Derbyshire and Leicestershire and go, it's a greenfield site, so let's trench it for bell pits because you've got to build up the lines of evidence to support that theory. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, there was no, yeah, there was no, there was no evidence of precedence there. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Sam Oakley. I'm a geophysicist at Atkins Realis, so yeah. you can have a good guess at what these questions are going to be about. <laughs> um, with the geophysical investigation, uh, how did that impact the intrusive ground investigation? Did it help constrain the locations or the number of intrusive investigations? Well, it certainly, it certainly highlight. well, it, it, was, it was a blessing and a curse because the conductivity stuff... Uh, highlighted or effectively uh, confirmed the stuff from the aerial survey on the on the east of the hedge line but then we were left with a red herring on the west of the hedge line which we investigated but uh, this is why the, the ultimate conclusion is is you know we can't just take geophys on its own merit and it needs to be uh, just just thrown into the, the, the you know the, the melting pot of uh, of information and and and, and appraised as we go. Yeah, I thought thought it was quite interesting because looking at that conductivity data, it outlined a similar image to that historical yes. imagery. Could you have taken an approach of doing one or two trial pits in that area to see? Well, we ended up causing this. And well, we ended up doing it. I mean, because we couldn't, we we can't, we can't excavate on that side of the hedge and find something and not do it on the other. So. Um, the the GIF is definitely helped, but it was um, you know versus you know there's many other different survey techniques such as you know I know uh, gravity anomalies was was thrown out there, but effectively whether that would have borne out something more valuable is is kind of a, a never answered question. But it, for the size of the site, it would have taken too long 
you know, commercially, it wasn't particularly viable at that stage. And, and you know, we're, we're at that, we're, we tend to get involved in, in SI schemes where we're at the sharp end of the stick and a lot of the developers, they've, they've had a lot of the information before. So we're sat there really sharpening the pencil and saying, you know, do you need that in your stack up or should we just go in there and do some cheap day, two days trial pitting and find out what, what the crack is. So it's, yeah, it was used to refine it slightly, but not um, not not on its own merit, let's say. Yeah, no, I fully agree that it should be combined with intrusive ground investigation to constrain the data. Um, another point was determining the depth of. You said that the key the key factor was how the depth of these features was only to five meters. Yeah. So was that determined purely by? the follow on ground investigation to yeah. the geophysical survey. Yeah, that was yeah. effectively uh, proven through uh, the trial pits through through the bell pits themselves to get an idea on where where the the good weathered uh, lower lower pennine uh, coal measures was. Okay. And um, was a was a second phase geophysical investigation considered to try and determine that depth? No. Doing like one or two profiling surveys. No, it was uh, it was really uh, at that point in time it was uh, really uh, hell for leather in terms from pressure from the developer, yeah. you know, in terms of you know really need a decision and it needs to be cheap because uh, we need you know we're either buying this or we're not. So it's we're sort of we're we're locked in that sort of zone of you know oh by the way guys you could do this and and you might do this and and we all know as uh, ground investigation specialist that um it's a really hard sell <laughs> you know oh, by the way if you spend 20 grand of your money you know i can get you more value and i say well what value is that because i've just given you 20 grand and they're like, yeah but it's more grounding for you know it's it's a difficult conversation that i, I don't think that argument will go away very very lightly okay yeah, thanks for the presentation it's really interesting thank you <laughs> We've got a lot of questions online. So, so right, here we go. Um, were they bell-shaped on excavation? They are so close, it looks like they would join up at depth. Uh, they, 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 well, they don't meet the typical bell uh, detail that you would see in the Syria, in the Syria guide. They were more of a, of a bowl shape, to be honest. Um, I think we've slightly touched on this, but we'll come back over it just to make sure we've answered it. Where was groundwater level and how effective was geophysics and how did you select a methodology that worked? I assume that's in relation to the geophysics. Yeah, so the the, the, the geophysics itself, uh, given I'm not a geophysical specialist, we uh, handed that to Teradat and we, uh, uh, you know, we didn't give them the reins. We, we gave them a steer in terms of what would what would work economically. Um, and timescales and, and all that sort of output also comes into it. Um, I think groundwater was probably, I think off the top of my head, about a metre, two metres down. So, uh, yeah, hence the high moisture contents in the material. It pretty much soaked the whole of that uh, made ground material. So you didn't have to drain anything when you started excavating? No, well, it, it just meant that the, the, it, the groundwater was incredibly variable. So you... Right. You, you've got you've got one pit that's half a meter. You've got another that's a meter down, and it's you know a bit all over the shop. Right, I'm going to combine two here. So, uh, were there any issues from potential contaminants and their reuse on site? And uh, were you able to reuse the site one material under the clear guidance? Well, this site was done in 2017, so. Uh, there was yeah there was no there was no contamination issues whatsoever which was um, slightly surprising to be honest um, but yeah from from a from a effectively what is I don't think it could have been considered a waste because it was effectively reused on site uh, right did you use geogrid anywhere to minimise settlement no no bulk excavation. Right. And piles. There's one left from the uh, the chat, and then I've got one of my own. Um, so, was there any evidence of a fill cycle from one excavation to another? Quite like that. A fill cycle. Yeah. They take it out one. No, it, it didn't. 
without well in in fairness without without methodically i don't know how you would uh, i don't I, I don't quite understand how you would even realize there was a fill cycle unless you, unless one investigated methodically from each pit um it all looked the same effectively so and then the question the final question is any more the, the one from me is it, at the very start you put up uh, the aerial photography mm. and the archive imagery and there was your site which was an obvious dark patch but i thought on the same image there were two other patches that yeah. looked similar just off sort of towards the end of your site what effectively was your site boundary yeah have those areas been investigated and, and are you getting a similar thing from there so or the so the other areas were really uh what i thought was highlighting the former clay pits so there was a bit there was a bit of darkness to the north of the bell pit area um and so you know that's that's as important to try and prove the negative of well what's clay pit what's not clay pit what's excavation what's just saturated ground you know it's also coincides with a low point on the site so um yeah nothing nothing in particular there. all right super um oh one more John Davis again. So just come to come back to that fill cycle question. Um, I, I think the answer is on the screen. Surely, that, that if if the the most likely uh, product that was being sought in these pits is the material that comes out of the shaft, yeah. then there's no fill cycle, and you can see that there. They've imported material to backfill them, so they were looking for the orange stuff. Is that fair? I, I think that it's it's. You know why? Why they were looking for it? Don't know, but it's 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 it's. It, if I could put a time on this, it might be easy to answer. But <laughs> if we're talking like two thousand years ago, it's very difficult, isn't it? I no, fascinating, fascinating. It's an unsolved mystery, <laughs> right? And on that bombshell, as they used to say, um. Thank you very much to everybody that's joined us online. Thank you very much, Andrew, for coming and giving that talk. No um, I, as I've already said, I do find it very interesting. And if those of us that are in the room could thank Andrew in the usual way. I'm just looking for him.